huge, huge thank you to everyone for showing up. You know, we, we have multiple uh, competing things happening in our lives and to take the time and to say, I'm gonna spend this hour, you know, on Zoom uh, for an Aikido class uh, and spending it kind of on yourself and your own practice and your own, you know, uh, development, like, thank you. Uh, the presence of people who show up is, is really what I am valuing in my life these days. Um, so with that, uh, today is going to be a little bit different. Uh, again, I feel like we've all taken many, you know, uh, Zoom classes, uh, and if we're just kind of trying to do Aikido techniques as if a partner were there, we're kind of missing out on the benefit of what the medium has to offer us. Um, so I'm going to do a little bit of a hybrid uh, TED Talk as well as an Aikido class. So you'll see I'll be going back and forth between doing some screen sharing talking about some new ideas, and then also obviously moving our bodies because that's hugely important. Um, I am going to um, incorporate some Joe work, uh, again, just using a Joe for some stretching as opposed to doing any actual Joe work. So if you have something like a Joe around or a stick or broomstick, anything, again, not necessary, um, but if you want to take a second, uh, get it uh, uh, close by, that would be great. Um, and uh, we are going to start before I chat any longer with a bow in and a, a, a quick warm up because um, I really do feel like one of the things that has emerged for me out of this pandemic is this idea that if we are spending so much of our life energy um, sitting and looking at screens, um, there's this uh, 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 line in the embodiment community that I love, which is don't treat your body like a brain taxi. Right, so just a taxi to kind of walk your brain around. Um, so we need to embody ourselves. So we're just going to start off with moving the body, getting the blood flowing, getting some circulation going. Um, so let's uh, bow in. And uh, also, um, again, no shame in this. Like if you're in your car, but if you are in an opportunity to actually get away from your desk, just let yourself kind of move everything a little bit in whatever capacity you're able to. That would be great. Hey, let's stand up and take some space. So starting uh, with a nice kind of horse stance and just let yourself um, plant your feet and just move your arms back and forth. So just getting that nice feeling of this movement and that your center is what moves your arms, right? So you're feeling that core strength from your belly, letting the arms be loose like heavy ropes. And you'll see during these warm ups, I talk a lot because I'm also a yoga instructor. So I'm going to just give you a lot of verbal cues, which also means you don't have to be looking at the screen. So now what I want you to do is lift up your feet. So you're going to lift up on that toe and then look over a shoulder, right? So now you're just starting to make this motion a little bit bigger. Really take in your surroundings, take in the full room, just noticing all four corners, 360 degrees. And then just start to make the motion smaller again. So we come back to that feeling of the power generating from our center and the arms slow down. And we take a nice big lunge step and stretch to the side. It's as if you're reaching for something, right? So your fingertips are reaching out at the same time that heel is pushing down into the ground. Just getting this nice cross lateral stretch reaching, opening up the armpit, and we switch. Again, stretching, reaching with the fingers, pushing that heel into the floor. Brian said, say, if you're doing this in the cafe, I hope everyone's really enjoying. Right? Nice. So. <laughs> and then nice big circles, right? So this is an, our hip warm up from Aikido. So really loosen up the hip, letting the hip go, but that feeling that you are um, holding this nice big ball. And as you do this, let's have your gaze follow your hands. So that's gonna make your circle a little bit bigger, right? So where we place our gaze when we warm up is something people don't normally talk about, but your gaze is huge in terms of the quality of your movement. So gaze following that nice big circle. And don't be afraid to take up space, 
especially if you're in a cafe. <laughs> nice, and then just shift the weight from side to side. And we drop to one side, either staying up here if you want to drop farther down, feel free. And switch. And then this low lunge, again, if you're comfortable dropping that knee down, right, we're going to take the front hands and push that front knee away. So this, if you did no other stretch during the pandemic, this one I think is a beautiful kind of lizard stretch where we're opening up the psoas, which is so important for all the sitting that we've been doing. At the same time, see if you can open up that chest. Nice, and then we switch sides. Again, opening up that front of the quad, front of the leg, pushing your front knee away, and then opening up the collarbones, chest, heart area, sinking, settling down. Nice, and then we come back to our horse stance. You can see if you can, instead of the shoulders dropping down, drop your spine straight down. And then you're going to inhale, the head reaches tall. Then exhale, twist to one side. And then lengthen again as you inhale, twist to the other side. Again, one more lengthen up. And this time, letting the hands come inside the knees. Maybe shifting your weight from side to side. Grabbing around the elbows, inhaling up, exhale, stretch it back. Again, inhaling up, letting everything go behind you. One more time, nice big deep breath. Good, and circles with the arms. Again, just really bringing some vitality, blood flow in and across. So think about thumbs leading out, right? Good, and then hands come to your hips and get that feeling of your pelvis tilting forward as you fold forward, letting the head drop down. And again, wherever your arms rest, just again, Getting that nice feeling of switching up the blood flow. And then we'll start with that waking up the body. So your hands, open the back of your legs, front of the legs, front of the body, and down the outside of the arm, coming up the inside, across the chest. Like, hello body, good morning, wake it up. And then hand blade, shoot to side of the neck. And switch. And this nice percussive feeling using the fingertips all the way around your skull, crown of the head, your face, you got your cheekbones, your jawline. And then all the way around the edges of your ears. This one comes from Tomura Sensei. He said, if you pull your ears, you'll never get sick. I don't know if it's true, but it feels good. Nice. And head moves from side to side. Up and down. And then ear to shoulder. And then let your chin drop, clasping the hands behind, elbows drop down. And you're gonna inhale, opening up, stretching back. Exhale, dropping down, rounding the back. So you can think about this as like a standing cat cow if you're familiar with yoga, right? So opening up those elbows as you inhale, arching the back and then rounding the back as you exhale down. Just a couple more times at your own pace. Nice inhaling up. Exhaling down and let your head fall back into your hands, right? So your 
Hands are grabbing your head, really opening. And exhale down. Finally, one last open. We bring the arms forward. Let your fingertips reach out to either side. So really find length as if someone was pulling your hands in both directions. And then you're going to create this uh, goalpost shape or cactus, right? And you're going to take those elbows and bring them together again, rounding the back and then open them up. Take those elbows a little bit farther. And I love this image. Think about squeezing a tennis blade between your shoulder blades and then let it go. Round it, open it, rounding the back, dropping that tennis ball, and then squeezing the tennis ball. And again, just a couple more. Beautiful. And we're going to do one of my favorite um, shoulder openers. Um, this one you might even be able to do in your car. Um, so uh, we call this the tea ceremony. So it's as if you were holding a cup of tea and it's been filled to the brim, right? And you're gonna take that cup of tea, you're gonna bring it to your center, and then you're gonna bring it underneath your arm, all the way out. And you're gonna bring it around your head, all the way around without spilling any of that tea, and then back to your center, right? And you can see, this is a beautiful warm up, to loosen up the shoulder, as well as kind of a perfect setup for ikkyo kemi, right? So what does this look like? I'm releasing that shoulder, right? Letting my arm come all the way around and back down. Let's do another. Underneath the arm, bring it all the way around. Hopefully you have not spilled any of your tea. If you're in that cafe, you might want to try it with your cup of coffee. I don't know, it might get a little messy though. So again, we start with other hand, bringing the cup of tea, or coffee underneath the arm. Think eek yo kemi. We loosen up that shoulder as the arm comes all the way around. And again, don't worry about doing this right, right? Think about just what's giving you mobility that you might not have been feeling yet today in your shoulder. So underneath. Nice. And now you absolutely are gonna have to spill your cups of tea. But but the whole goal here is not to spill anything. So two cups of tea, right? So we go underneath, all the way around, and back down. So you're gonna have to use your lower body for this, right? So getting underneath the arms, circling back and around. And again, you have that nice feeling of the shoulder blades coming together in your back, squeezing that tennis ball. And really getting that imagery that you're trying not to spill a cup of tea in your hand. And this should feel really good. If there's any part of this that doesn't feel good, um, modify it, make it smaller, change it. I am all about figuring out how to do movement, how to do Aikido that feels good. Because really, we don't have that much time on the planet. Might as well spend your time doing things that feel good. Oh, and, and being kick-ass. And... Bring those cups of tea back and we drop them. Shake it out. Nice. I don't know about you, but that now gets me in a whole different uh, state of being and openness. So I don't know about you. Does anyone else have a to do list like this today? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I have had. I've had a huge amount of stress personally, and I don't know about you, about actually the pandemic being over and that feeling of, oh my God, what do I have to show for it, right? I have to admit that like when it first started, and again, mind you, I am so grateful um, that I have really uh, weathered the pandemic all right. Um, uh, and, and I definitely um, have sensitivity and wanna acknowledge folks who have had a really, incredibly hard and tragic time with this pandemic. Um, but for, for many of us, um, there was the anxiety and the hardship, um, but not necessarily the huge tragedy that has uh, affected so many people. Um, so in the lightness that I present this, um, know that there's also uh, a depth for that understanding. Um, so anyway, the sense that suddenly we are back to life somewhat like 
normal, although obviously still being safe and still knowing the pandemic's happening, but what do I have to show for it? So there's this anxiety that I have about that, um, that I am just super honest about sharing with that, you today, um, because I think it's kind of interesting. Um, and I started the pandemic much more hopeful. Um, I uh, definitely, um, you know, and I think I put this out to my membership because I really wanted to be positive. Um, but I came up with this sense of, you know, the, the Chinese uh, character of danger and opportunity being what crisis is about. So we have this huge danger out there, this incredible world pandemic. But is there some sort of opportunity that we can take advantage of? You know, and um, as I mentioned, you know, the, the world connection that's happened in Aikido and Zoom classes has been a huge opportunity that's emerged so that that classic um it uh, I, I know i can be super annoying but that person who always sees the glass half uh half full it is super annoying sometimes but it was actually super helpful to me at the beginning of the pandemic to really have this uh this sense of what how can we actually make this a good thing um, and, and I don't know about you, but a lot of people started doing this as well. But this idea of really thinking about an overhaul, right? Like maybe actually things before the pandemic, you know, let's face it, maybe they actually weren't that great. Um, and maybe we have suddenly are having all these constraints um, so that we actually get to think about, you know, a before and after scenario. How can we actually, you know, maybe, you know, redo our homes or redo our mental states, you know, go into therapy, whatever, this idea of overhaul uh, and having the time for the self-reflection to do it um, was a really uh, positive part of the, the beginning of this year for me, for sure. Um, and I was also really lucky that I had people around me who had this idea of the long game, um, this idea that we really needed to start the pandemic running the right race. You know, when we first closed our dojo in Seattle, we were, I think, one of the first ones to close um, because, uh, you know, Seattle had the first cases. And so early March, we were closing our doors and people were like, oh, we're going to be, you know, closed maybe for two weeks or whatever. Um, and again, I, I really thank some super smart people I have in my dojo, Amy, who's on the call today, too, um, for coming in with some sound advice that said, this is a marathon. We have got to be ready for hunkering down. Um, and I say this today too, um, thinking that we are, if, if you are thinking that we are jumping back into the sprinting uh, arena, we're still in a marathon mode, I think. Um, so knowing that you're running the right race, I think is super, super important. So with that in mind, I was like, okay, I've got all this time, what do I wanna do? So again, I love lists, so I created my to-do list. And I'll be really curious to know if anyone else has similar things. I'm gonna get in the best shape of my life, right? Awesome. And I've always wanted to learn Morse code. Maybe, you know, we were talking earlier, maybe you were like, I'm gonna learn a new language like Duolingo, isn't that awesome? <laughs> or you're gonna write that novel, right? So we all have these like big ideas of like what we could do. Um, but maybe your pandemic looked a little bit more like this. <laughs> right? Uh, and again, no shame in this. But yeah, Netflix happened. And a lot of Netflix happened. And I think a big part of that too, was the anxiety of having a pandemic happen to us. You know, the, the whole nervous system, you know, even if we were not in direct um, uh, conflict, um, the, the nervous system had to take care of itself. So I do think um, that that being able to like go internal um, and just do whatever kind of self care you needed to do um, was also a big learning part of, of our year. Um, and it also for me led to a fair amount of self reflection. Um, and Netflix watching, really good shows. If you want my list later, I'll give it to you. Um, but this led to basically some of the content uh, that I'm gonna share today. And this concept of what is unshakable in your Aikido practice. Um, and I think that um, uh, uh, I started to actually go uh, and think about the other sides of Aikido that I hadn't practiced before, that I had never really given credence to. I've always been super physical and really loving to work out and do break falls. Um, but this idea that there is the meditative side of what we do um, and a meditation practice and a spiritual side of Aikido. And what is at the core of our practice that is entirely unshakable? And when I say unshakable, um, you know, what does that word actually mean? Because to me, um, it becomes a really interesting word because the pandemic showed us 
realized something very clearly that I don't think I knew before. And what it showed me was that everything in our life is shakeable, right? So, so the pandemic basically took everything away, right? We, it pulled the rug out, you know, from the entire world. Uh, and we have to acknowledge that that new paradigm, that new understanding, that everything can be taken away from you in a way. Um, and you have to figure out still, right? What, what remains, what's there? Um, so, so asking that question, what is shakeable, made me start to think about deconstructing my life, right? And deconstructing Aikido. So when I say deconstruct, right? What I mean here is if we think about like the armature of a body with all of these things on it, clothing that we wear, right? And if you started to take things away, you know, what remains? So when the pandemic first hit, you know, what got deconstructed first was our sense of our safety and our health, right? It was dangerous to go outside. You know, we couldn't touch a door. We couldn't like get takeout. Um, obviously, if we were, you know, a uh, emergency worker, you know, um, our lives were in danger of just having to interface with the public. So our health suddenly got deconstructed, taken away. Um, work became entirely different again. Maybe every time we went to work, we were suddenly in danger, right, with the public. Or for many people, especially in Seattle in high tech, you know, this idea that you have to work from home and not go into an office. Like if you had said a year ago, offices are going to become obsolete for tech workers, we'd be like, are you kidding me? No way, right? But actually, guess what? The world can function with people not going into an office. Imagine that. Um, but also for many people, they actually lost their work. Um, so for, for me, I have to say, I had made this big life leap about five years ago where I quit my day job to run the dojo full time. Uh, and it was the best choice I've ever made. I don't regret it. But again, I had no idea that this year was going to happen. And suddenly, you know, I couldn't work. So um, again, just an acknowledgement that as we deconstruct our life, you know, your sense of who you are and your being and the, how that gets fulfilled by what you do can actually get taken away, right? And you have to then look at what else is there. Uh, and so oftentimes we go to the people who are closest to us, right? Our, our social network, the fabric of our family, our friends. Um, and even that though, you know, uh, hopefully you did all right with who you were living with, you know. Um, I was in 400 square feet with one other guy and man, you know, there were some challenges there. Um, but, uh, you know, we all figured it out, but not being able to have physical contact and touch and hug grandparents, um, friends, family, super, super hard, but that can actually be taken away, right? Um, and then obviously, if you're on this call, a huge part of what was taken away for all of us was our dojo community, which for so many of us is our family, right? Um, so getting the dojo taken away, um, getting that community that I got to see every single day and the nourishment that I got from that suddenly gone, like overnight gone, right? Um, was a huge blow. Um, but at the end of the day, it can be taken away. And to realize that was super important. Um, the other part, I think, of the dojo being taken away was the mental health that comes with our practice. Um, I don't think I really realized it. I feel like I have been, for most of my life, luckily a pretty happy person. But I think so much of that is actually working out five days a week, you know, and the endorphins that we create from the physical practice of Aikido. Um, and so suddenly to not have that physicality every day, um, I started to get depressed. And I heard a lot of other Aikido people say that. They're like, man, I didn't realize I depended on this so much. I'm actually thinking that it could be a new marketing ploy. So got depression, try Aikido, uh, you know, forget the Prozac, whatever. Um, I'm somewhat light about that, but I think it's actually pretty serious that our mental health is sustained by um, our physical workout in the dojo. So we take these things away, right? And then ultimately the question is what remains, right? Um, all those things that we thought were essential, what then is the armature? So if you know, we're, we're looking at our little person, you know, what is the structure of the armature that is there that can't actually be taken away? Um, and I came across this beautiful Japanese phrase. There are always great Japanese words for things, right? That we don't have in our language. And furoshin, 
which is unshakable mind, right? Fudoshin is what can't be taken away. Um, what is unshakable in you? Um, and in Aikido, we have many shins, right? So shin being mind or heart uh, in Japanese. We have zanshin, you know, when we throw and we have presence. Um, we have shoshin, uh, beginner's mind. Fudoshin was kind of a new concept to me, this idea of what is unshakable when we take everything away, right? When we sit like a mountain, what is unshakable? Um, and I started to look at, you know, obviously the psychology of your own life and you deconstruct it, but also the, the what happens when we deconstruct Aikido, right? What is unshakable and what makes Aikido practice Aikido practice, right? So when the pandemic first came, this, is, this next one is, uh, this is the last image of me in my beautiful 3000 square foot dojo space. It was gorgeous. And um, I was giving up the lease uh, and moving out, you know, 20 years, 20 plus years in a space. And again, I'm trying to be hopeful here. And so my messaging was Aikido is not a place, okay? So Aikido certainly is not the facility it's in. It's not necessarily the physical dojo. We can take the place away. I was pretty clear and confident about that. We all figured out how to move into, you know, being outside, being on Zoom, um, being in, uh, I, I got very lucky to have a basement dojo. Uh, so, so if Aikido is not a place, what else can you take away and still have Aikido? Um, and so, you know, I'm just going to throw out a couple things, but in your own mind, think about what are the things that you can take away, right? Um, do you have to wear a gi to do Aikido? Not necessarily. You can take that away. We all did um, Aikido and street clothes for much of the pandemic. Um, then it starts to get a little bit more complicated. Can you take away a training partner, right? Is it no longer Aikido if you take away your partner? Um, is that an essential part? If you take away uh, shihonage, you know, uh, if you take away kosha, a lot of people have taken away koshinage anyway. Um, but if you start to take away the curriculum, is it still Aikido? So, so thinking about that, what makes it still Aikido, right? If we start to deconstruct it and take things away? Um, super interesting, deep question. And so, in a very simplistic way, obviously what we were left with, you know, during this pandemic was this idea of solo practice, right? So clearly I can't practice with anyone else, but I think, and ultimately my discovery was that I need to figure out how to make a solo practice what is still uh, an unshakable part of my, my relationship with Aikido. Um, <clears throat> And I realized too, that as I was taking a bunch of Zoom classes and getting a little frustrated, and I don't mean to diss any other instructor, but sometimes when Zoom classes were taught and they were all about um, pretend you have a partner or let's take, uh, there's, you know, go do Kemi. There was something really unsatisfying to me about that. But the classes that I enjoyed the most were when people had deep solo practices that they shared. Like I know um, Yan Sensei did a whole series on the relationship between Aikido and Qigong, right? And Tai Chi. Um, I've definitely done a bunch of teaching about Aikido and uh, yoga. And I know Art Arturo has made a lot of those Aikido yoga connections as well too. Um, bringing in natural movement or Feldenkrais work. Um, so people who are also able to draw on solo practices and make that a deeper part of your understanding of your own anatomy and your body and how you then bring that to Aikido, to me seemed like a, a clue. And so within solo practice, I'm going to come up with um, these, these three concepts that to me were unshakable in my solo practice, okay? Um, and basically I started with this idea of what if Aikido warmups are actually the real practice? I know it sounds a little bit weird, um, but I have to say I've talked to a bunch of uh, people who have done Aikido for a long time, old timers, historians, and people point to the fact that Oh Sensei thought that we got to the techniques too quickly. Um, and that there was a certain level of developing your own internal power, right? Um, before you actually were given the secrets of Aikido techniques, but that people hadn't developed their own internal power first. So that idea of Masogi practice, standing out of the waterfall, and what are the other things that we do to develop that internal um, power before we then engage with another person? Um, and so to me, I think the key to that question is actually in the Aikido warmups. 
Um, and again, you can ping me after this talk because I could, this could be a whole hour in and of itself, this slide, but I have done a fair amount of research to look at the origins of a, the Aikido warm-up. Um, and one of the most interesting things um, that I've come across um, is um, the Aikido warm-up is pretty fascinating. Um, there's a lot of breath work um, as well as, um, you know, um, trigger point stuff. And there is a direct correlation um, between something called Japanese yoga um, uh, and the Aikido warm up. And it turns out that O Sensei was key, uh, a colleague and a, a peer uh, with another sensei by the name of Nakamura Tempu Sensei, who was credited with bringing, Aiki or bringing um, yoga from India to Japan. Um, and he put his own um, flavor on it. But again, you could go down a rabbit hole learning about this, but he called his um, process Shin Shin Totsu Do. Um, and it was introduced at Hambu Dojo. Um, and in particular, uh, Kuichi Tohei Sensei became very um, uh, interested in it. And you will see a lot of that practice in what then emerged as Ki Aikido or Ki Society. But we have also maintained it uh, within our traditional um, Aikido warm ups as well. Um, so huge wealth to really dig in um, to, to the Aikido warm up um, and to look at. Um, the, the roots of it. Um, and then uh, finally, too, if you haven't uh, dug at all into, um, for those of you who I don't know already, I'm a total Bruce Lee fanatic, like I have Bruce Lee t-shirts and everything. Uh, but he is such a proponent of the, the warm up uh, and that self conditioning um, before you engage with another partner. Um, so check out some of the, the Bruce Lee warm up stuff as well, because uh, there's a total richness to that. So so again, back to, okay, for I'm gonna do this solar practice, I'm gonna engage with the warm-up. Um, one of the three key relationships, right, that is unshakable in that um, to begin with is my relationship with my axis. And another way to say that is my relationship with my spine. Shiba Sensei was very famous um, for, he wrote a whole series on cultivating the Aikido body. And he said a key to that was our understanding of the spine, again, another link you could check out. Um, but oftentimes in Aikido, I think we talk about the center, like find your center. Um, but I find it far more useful to talk about the spine or, uh, because it's the, the dimensionality of your center, right? Um, so this idea that your axis is you standing between heaven and earth and your center, right? Finding the dimensionality, O Sensei's bridge between heaven and earth um, and this is also where that idea of the, um, the circle, triangle, square comes from, that the human form stands between heaven and earth. Um, and so we are in this unique position and we should figure out how to use our access in a way that is an embodiment of that. Um, and I also think it's a key to making your Aikido better um, because oftentimes, again, some of my favorite teachers like Osawa Sensei will make people do solo practice um, for what feels like a very, very long time. And then he makes you go back with a partner and everyone was doing beautiful solo practice, finding this lovely access. And then we go back to doing Taino Hanko with our partner and we completely like put ourselves in these crazy positions, right? So, so that finding your access and that being a huge part of your solar practice and then figuring out once you've found it how you take it back is hugely important so now we're going to get physical again okay so i'm going to um go back to uh grabbing a joe if you can and i have to stop my screen share here okay so grab your Joe and we're going to talk about the axis a little bit. So again, standing, you know, with, uh, with soft knees um, and with the Joe in front of you, get that feeling of alignment, right? So you're lining up the Joe with your spine and right hand on top, left hand on the bottom. See if you get the, get the feeling of pulling the Joe apart. So you're going to, push the lower hand into the floor and pull the top part up towards the ceiling. So you are now that embodiment of standing between heaven and earth. And hopefully you, when you have this feeling of this isometric movement, right? You're getting this feeling I, I get of length, right? So you start to feel maybe the spine lengthen a little bit as you get this feeling of pushing down at the same time of pulling up. And so much of the paradox of our Aikido practice is this idea of pushing.
pushing down to pull up, right? And doing both of those things at the same time, right? So from here, that pulling up and pushing down. So finding that sweet space between heaven and earth, right? So we've now lengthened the spine. We have that nice feeling. And we'll just do, again, this is borrowing some breath work. Um, so heaven and earth, like Tenchinage, heaven and earth breathing. So this idea of breathing in, you feel that length of your spine, and then one hand going to the earth, the other hand going to heaven, and it splits. And then the hands meet each other. So we inhale, right? Lengthening the spine as one hand pushes down, the other extends up and the hands come together. Again, you can go at your own pace. You don't need to follow me. So inhaling, feeling the breath come up through your feet. And then that nice right in the middle of your center split between heaven and earth, having both of those two actions happen at the same time. So that inhaling up and then split heaven and earth. And again, if you did nothing else during the pandemic but this breathing exercise, I guarantee you'd come back to the mat and your Aikido would be entirely different. We often, as we do breathing exercises, we think about the breath just as the front of our body, but I'd like you in the next round to think about breathing into your back. So feel that breath come up the back of your spine, all the way up to the back of your head. Nice, we'll do one more. And now that feeling of your breath being three-dimensional. So breathing out into the ribs. Actually, go ahead and put your hands on your ribs to begin with. So you can really feel the breath being three-dimensional, breathing out to the sides as well as just up and down. And then let your body mimic that, right? So breathing with motion, opening up. Nice. So now you have this nice sense of the spine lengthening and the fact that we can actually use our breath to get that feeling of heaven and earth and lengthening the spine, I think is really important. We also, we stand in Aikido, right? In harmony a lot. Um, and again, we compromise ourselves in our harmony so that our spine ends up breaking, right? So being too far forward or sometimes people's pelvises or too far back, right? So I'd like you to take whatever you have stick and stand in harmony, right foot forward, left foot forward, and just get the feeling of your Joe making contact along the back side of your body, right? And let yourself sink into that front knee into harmony, and you're letting that Joe, you can feel it on the back of your head, back of your back. It's gonna not stay in contact all the way along probably, but see if you can connect it to the back of the leg. Right. Yeah, and then you take the jaw away and still see if you can maintain that nice length and connection. That same feeling too of energy coming out the top of your head and again, pushing down through your back heel. And then just switch to the opposite omni, right? So again, using your jaw, feeling that length the access here. And you'll notice you can't, if you separate your head, right, you've broken the access. And if there's anything that I think Aikido people do too much of, right, it's actually separating our head from our spine, from our axis, where we jut the chin forward and our head comes forward, maybe offering our hand in Taino Henko. So if you did, again, nothing else, that idea of finding your head as part of this axis, right, and almost always it's going to be letting the chin settle back again into a, a more natural state. I love this idea too, that the spine wants to find neutral. It doesn't, it doesn't actually like it when we go off neutral, it wants to find neutral. Okay, so super useful, I think, even when we're getting back to practice, to just check in on our own spines. And then when we think about engaging with another partner, right, and we are, again, I'm thinking Taino Hengo, right? We do all this crazy stuff as both Uke and Nage. I'm going to have you put your Joe out and Tenkan by bringing your center to the Joe and pivoting around that axis. Right? And again, center comes to the Joe, 
pivot around that axis. Then do both sides, right? So you really have this feeling. And notice if you're if the Joe's moving, right? Then you're kind of missing the point. But see if you can keep that axis and align your spine with that motion. Okay. And then this becomes actually really fun when we do e Remy Tenkan. So you're gonna again leave that Joe as your axis, e Remy, and you're gonna switch your hands to Tenkan. You're trying to keep that Joe all the way upright. E Remy, Tenkan. Again, if you did nothing else but this exercise, I really think that when you came back to partner practice, uh, the quality of your practice. Right, would be amazingly different. So e Remy and con. Okay. So that is um, one of my core unshakable concepts of my solo practice is absolutely doing um, work that focuses on finding that access and then figuring out how not to compromise it when I come back to partner practice. I'm gonna move us on um, to, uh, again, uh, we're, we're gonna stay in motion, um, but I'm gonna just do a quick screen share here. Oopsie. Uh, for my next core unshakable relationship. So we found the access. The next one is gravity. Okay, so if if we just did access work, we could be doing tai chi or yoga. But the 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 quality of our relationship with gravity um, is so core and essential to Aikido, and it's what really, to me, makes this practice. Um, so unique and it's why I don't do something else, right? Um, and so we spend a lot of time in Aikido um, thinking about uh, gravity and our relationship with fallen um, because we are also a unique martial art in that we don't just teach the throw, we also teach the art of fallen, we teach the art of ukemi. So we teach how to actually get yourself from standing down to the ground. Um, one of the things that I've been super interested in before the pandemic um, but certainly during the pandemic as well, is not only teaching how we get ourselves using gravity to come down, but how do we actually teach people to get up off the ground, right? Think about it. Like how much time in an Aikido class, once you're on the ground, have you thought about how you organize your body to get up? So this unique relationship that we have with gravity is super, super important and super interesting. And there's so much to unpack there, right? So if we just start again, on the ground, sitting in Seiza. Um, and again, if we had a whole hour, I would basically make you think about how you organize yourself to get up off the ground. But I'm gonna, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a cheat. I think almost always we have choices about um, getting up that are often either linear or uh, circular following a spiral. So if you're sitting in Seiza, think about how many times you've been sitting in Seiza, you've bowed in, and then you get up to practice, right? How do you organize yourself to get up to practice? Okay, I'm here. Am I gonna use my hands to get up? How am I gonna organize myself to get <laughs> that foot to move forward? So most of us, right, will probably have, again, uh, you might break your axis by having the weight of your head move forward. What I'd like you to do today is to think about keeping that axis, right? And tilting the pelvis. So being really conscious about the way you get out of Seiza, right? First being tilting the pelvis, right? And then you're in a position to organize yourself to stand up, right? So again, do it different ways. You can start by the head and the shoulders coming forward and organize yourself. You can think about what do I normally do without being conscious of it and thinking about it. And then actively think about tilting the pelvis, keeping the spine straight, and then getting yourself to stand up. And again, I'm not saying that there is one right way to get up. Um, so much of what I think what is so rich about our practice is that it's an inquiry. You figure out for your body what works for you. Because I'm gonna show you another way to get up 
right? Um, that's actually about completely keeping the spine straight and this idea of pushing down to come up, right? So this idea of wanting my spine to be completely straight, right? As I push my, um, my uh, front of my uh, shins into the floor, and I'm gonna use my quads, and I'm gonna basically, this idea of levitating straight up, right? And then we take the step to stand up. So again, try that too. If you do this, you know, 10 times, it's really gonna feel like a workout. But that idea of organizing yourself to push down, to come up. So again, you're exploring your relationship with gravity. And another thing to add, again, I know I'm throwing a lot at you, but thinking about, do we ever think about this when we bow and we get up, when are you taking the breath? Right? We spend so much time thinking about right hand first, left hand first, but do I know when I stand up, am I breathing in or am I breathing out? And does it make a difference? Again, I'm not going to tell you that there's one right way, but you should have a sense of a feeling and know right, what seems like the most efficient way to get up. So as you rise, does it feel more natural to inhale on the rise, right? Or does it feel more natural to exhale on the rise as you come up? Again, um, you know, in yoga, we cue how to take a breath for an entire hour. And I think it's something that would be so useful in an in a Aikido practice to start cueing people on when to breathe more um, because uh, this is wonderful. So keep practicing the coming up and down as I'm talking. Um, so that uh, idea, there's a Chinese um, uh, line uh, in the martial arts that the, the martial artist who has discovered um, his or her breath has uh, developed the power of 10,000 tigers. So harnessing our breath a little bit more efficiently, um, I think, again, is something out of the pandemic that I really, really um, resonated with. Okay, so gravity coming up in a straight line. Next, I'm gonna um, come down to the floor and think about if your legs are straight out, we find ourselves in this position in Aikido a lot. Again, how do you organize your body to get up, right? That straight line isn't entirely available to me anymore, right? Um, maybe going back, no. I'm probably gonna actually do that rotation circle to get myself up, right? So let's actually put our hands behind and have our knees up. And just get that feeling of your knees rotating, right, from side to side. So this gets me closer to sitting. I engage up, I'm feeling a little bit of that spiral, and then I'm gonna extend my hand and push my pelvis out, out of that reaching, right? Reach. This is an excellent, excellent core workout, by the way. So reaching, reaching, and then dropping down, reaching, and we stand up. Right? So again, this is not necessarily the only right way to get up, but to me, in all of my exploration, it's a super interesting, efficient way, right, to think about how I use gravity getting up off the ground. So again, I would challenge you, give yourself an hour in the dojo and just figure out, there are 10,000 different ways that you could organize your body to get up. Um, and we do it multiple times in a class but do we think about organizing our bodies in the most efficient way to do that? And for anyone here who has done some Feldenkrais work, you'll know that this is definitely borrowed from that concept of how do we most efficiently follow a natural um, spiral uh, to move our bodies to come up. And I really feel like Aikidoists could, could benefit from that. So again, if you are in a, a space where you can move uh, and roll, um, this practice becomes super interesting with that linear getting up, right, in a straight line, this idea of pulling our centers forward, right, rolling back, coming straight up in that linear way. Or if we do the soft dukemi circle roll, right, that idea of rolling to the side and using that spiral to get up. So again, I love, again, I could do these rolls all day long, right? Going and 
both directions and then figuring out how you follow the momentum of that circle to use gravity to get up off the ground. So I'm uh, assuming that folks might not have the ability to do full, full rolls here. Um, but just to add that the continuation of this practice for me when I'm in a dojo is then to think about from standing, how do you actually have a relationship with gravity where you don't just throw yourself into a roll forwards or backwards, but how do you let yourself um, like gravity initiate the roll, right? So this idea that I can be standing and lose my balance in any direction and be able to figure out how to either take a forward roll, right? Or a backwards roll. Um, and again, this is a Feldenkrais concept, but the idea that as martial artists, being able to develop a body that is flexible enough to move in any direction at any time is really the pinnacle of our practice in many ways. To me, it's the biggest self-defense that you could have, having that body, as opposed to being, you know, doing the best koshinage, developing a body that can move in any direction at any time, right? It's the ultimate self-defense. Uh, and I think it really is what we should aspire to as martial artists. So a big part of that is your relationship with figuring out gravity and your access as you um, move your body in any direction at any time. Okay, I'm gonna have to come back and whiz ourselves my way through uh, the remainder of my slides. And so that's pretty much um, our, our movement portion. And the next is a, I'm just gonna leave you with a, a little bit of a, a philosophical take here. So we come back to my screen. Boop. So axis, gravity. Finally, I'm throwing out a bunch of Japanese words at you. Uh, my apologies, but this one I think is super interesting. Ikigai uh, is again, a new concept for me and I'm not gonna explain it yet. I'm gonna start with a story. Um, and this might be a story that is familiar to many of you. And again, my apologies, but I really do think it gets at a critical part, which is the third relationship that we need with Aikido. And it's the bricklayer story. Uh, and very quickly, three bricklayers are asked uh, what they are doing. And they are out working on a hot day uh, in France, uh, laying bricks. And the first bricklayer is pretty gruff and he says, why are you bothering me? Can't you see I'm laying bricks? The second bricklayer is asked, what are you doing? And this bricklayer has a little bit of a bigger perspective and says, oh, well, I'm, I'm building a wall. Uh, and then finally, we come to the, the more humble uh, bricklayer with a little bit of a twinkle in his eye or her eye. Uh, and this bricklayer says, oh, well, can't you see? I'm building the most beautiful cathedral the world has ever seen. I'm building Sharp's Cathedral, right? So this idea of you can be doing exactly the same action, but having your reason for being, knowing your why, is so, so different in terms of how you approach something. Um, and if for any reason that story didn't get it for you, here's another one that I really love too. And again, people aren't quite sure if this is 100% true, um, but I love the story anyway. Uh, it's during the, the race to space, you know, in the 1960s and John F. Kennedy uh, visits NASA and he comes across a janitor in the hallway and he asks him, um, you know, what's your job here at NASA? And the, the, uh, the janitor responds, I'm helping to get a man on the moon, right? Um, so this idea of knowing your why and connecting it to something bigger and different, um, I think is a, a super important part of our practice that we don't actually talk about. Um, and maybe I'm more partial to it because I'm also an instructor. And for 20 years, I've had people tell me the reasons they can't come to class. <laughs> <laughs> and if you are instructors here, you know that too, right? Um, but I think, you know, there's so many things in our lives, time commitments, pressure, money, but mostly it's, it's our, when we've chosen a passion, we move mountains to make it work, right? So finding your ikigai, which is your reason for being uh, in Aikido, or the other way to think about it is what lights you up in the morning. And the term Ikigai comes from Okinawa in Japan, which is one of those blue zones where they discovered people are living to 100. And it's because they all have this deeply rooted concept of having a reason for being, 
Um, so when you have aligned your passions and your mission, and you have a really strong sense of what gets you up in the morning, what gets you to the dojo, um, then that becomes a core part of your practice. And it's not just about coming to the dojo to work out, to lose weight, to learn a self-defense, but you're connecting it to something higher and bigger. And again, this is where um, I can't tell you what your ikigai is, but I'll, I'll give you a little bit of taste of my own exploration over this year of what mine ended up being. Um, and this is a, just a quick little drawing. I'm sorry if it's not coming through too well, but if we look at the concentric circles of Aikido and the big circle, we all come to the dojo even as beginners. And the first thing we see are the techniques, the waza, right? So we all learn how to do Ikkyo and uh, perfecting your Ikkyo or that fact that it takes 20 years to get the perfect iriminage, right? Waza becomes so important, but at some level you get bored with that, you plateau. Um, and then you realize as you start to work with your partners that this idea of masubi, connection, right? That that interaction and that interplay um, between two people becomes super, super important. So then your practice becomes about masubi connection. Um, and many of us stay there um, because that is just such a lovely place to be in Aikido. But I would say, I'm going to say my ikigai you know, and again, it's just mine, not yours. Um, but mine is this idea, and, and people don't really talk about this, but mine is going to be transcendence. Uh, I know it, I don't want to sound woo-woo, but I do think that at a deeper level, that moment of you have found such a nice connection between two people, that the two people disappear, and that there is no self. And again, in my 30 plus years of Aikido, I can count on one hand the times that I have had that experience of transcendence on the mat, but I've had them, I know they exist, right? Um, and to me, the practice and why I go every single day is that I'm creating the conditions for that transcendence to happen again, to experience it, right? And so I know it's not gonna happen every day. Again, it happens maybe, you know, for me, hopefully you're more lucky, <laughs> but you know, maybe once a decade, but we're creating the conditions, right? For wanting to aspire to that kind of practice. So again, that's my ikigai, um, and everyone needs to personally come up, you know, with what their own is. And I'm just going to go a little bit longer because I want to take it out of that crazy heavy, you know, moment to the toothbrush and show, uh, tell a quick little story. So even if you're not connecting why you go to the dojo to some bigger vision, um, I love this story about the toothbrush. And it's a study that was done between Americans and Japanese. Um, and the study was to have um, participants go through their day and document all of the life decisions they made in their daily activities. And lo and behold, for some reason, even though they were living um, pretty uh, normal, uh, similar lives, the Americans made maybe five times more of the decisions during a day than the Japanese did. And the researchers were trying to figure this out. And the key thing that they realized was when it came to brushing their teeth. So Americans were like, yeah, I had to decide to brush my teeth when I was gonna brush, you know, what I, how I was gonna do it, you know, what I was gonna use. And the Japanese hadn't even documented brushing their teeth as a choice that they made. They were all doing it, they were all brushing their teeth, but it was so ingrained, right? In terms of it being a necessity for your life and part of like what you do, um, that it wasn't, they didn't even think about it as a choice. Right? It was just such an essential part of your being, of taking care of yourself, right? And uh, that it wasn't a choice. And I think about that when I think about the fact that in America, I think one of our problems is we make it a choice on whether or not we're going to go to the dojo every day, right? Oh, God, you know, traffic's bad today. I, don't, I got a little bit of a headache. Oh, that Netflix show I'm binging. So it becomes this choice. And if it's a choice, it's super, super hard. But if you've connected it with that bigger purpose, and it's just what you do, right? And you don't make a big deal out of it. Again, it doesn't have to be a big deal. But it's just like brushing your teeth then there becomes this sense of a daily practice, which is what leads us to the conditions, you know, for some really magical things to be happening. So again, it doesn't have to be big and lofty, you know, it can be like just brushing your teeth. And ultimately, it's really just about showing up, you know, and my last uh, statement here too is if you if this was confusing and you're like I don't know what my big reason is you know and you're ready to quit Aikido um, there is a sense of fake it till you make it sometimes and just show up and some magical things can happen when you show up because it's also acknowledging that your life isn't a dress rehearsal right um, all we have is our presence and all we have is this moment in time to show up 
uh, and be present with each other. And that's to me what is so exciting about being in a dojo with a community of people who have all chosen to do this together. So just show up, right? That is really what we are all about in this practice. And that's what I am emerging out of the pandemic with. Um, so with that, uh, I'm gonna pass it back uh, to uh, Brian to wrap us up. And I do have a huge desire uh, that I see all of you in person on the mat uh, one of these days in the not too distant future. Hi, como arigatou gozaimashita.